The biggest stars on YouTube today focus on larger than life videos and creating a massive spectacle. I spent two and a half million dollars from one foot to 1,000 feet off the ground. But what if you didn't need spectacle to keep people's attention? Now that creators are vlogging and, and bringing back the really personal grounded element, and that's bringing in lots of views, and then we're seeing the big spectacle content, that's spectacle content, that's bringing in lots of views. Well, what happens if I put those two together? And I think one of the best examples was Ryan Trahan's Penny series. It was a big spectacle road trip adventure of him traveling across the US, but it was a beautiful personal story about him adapting to the environments and circumstances that he found himself in. That's Hayden Hillier Smith, one of the biggest video editors on YouTube, who is known for making videos with Logan Paul since 2016. Now, Hayden is out on his own. He started a podcast called, appropriately, The Editing Podcast. And as a creator, Hayden isn't focused on spectacle. He's not even focused on retention. I don't care if I get 70 to 80% retention. If I get 50 to 40% retention, but that 50% of people that stayed meant they had a much more better time, then I've made a good video. So in this episode, you'll learn where YouTube is heading, how to capture people's attention, how to hire an editor, and why Hayden doesn't believe in creating videos for the YouTube algorithm. But now, let's talk with Hayden. What sticks out to you as like the hardest part of running an operation at the scale that you guys were doing, all that pressure on you as an editor, what was the hardest part of that? The hardest part was the work-life balance. Uh, I think once you're, once you're in that flow, that's the only thing that you know. And so I'd wake up, spend 10, 12 hour days getting X video done, go to sleep and get, wake up and get started again the next day. That was an incredible flow and was producing phenomenal results. If I'm honest, I wouldn't wish that on anyone. It's a very, very unhealthy mindset that we had. And so despite us getting the results that we have and that we can celebrate, it's actually not worth uh, the mental health toll that it did create. How many videos do you think you two made together over those years? Minimum 600. Wow. It's 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 the sheer amount. I, I I think I looked back on that library recently, and I think we've made also a total of over 50 hours of content as well. So if, and so yeah, so if you were to sit down and try to watch them all in one sitting, yeah, that's going to take you well over two days. But what a great two days that will be. How did you balance when you were working on your own channel and your own videos and your own content? How did you fit that stuff in? Logan would then go find a boxing opponent. And then that means that he has to, has to train on that. And so that gives me literally three months off. Once I got out of that flow and suddenly I didn't have a video to edit the next day, I'm like, what the hell am I going to do with my time? And so I figured, all right, I guess I'll just keep making videos. So I started making videos on my own channel and then that career started taking off a lot more. And so the mistake was for Logan to start training for a boxing fight. Otherwise he probably would have kept me. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. So during that period of time, and what year did you guys first start working together? We started working together at uh, September, 2016. So since that time, in the last six years, do you see like there have been different stages of YouTube. Like when we look at world history, we have like these different eras of things. And that, a six year period seems like a short period of time, but even within there, I would bet you've seen some changes. So what, what type of stages did you see as YouTube grew in the last six years? I think YouTube has this two to three year cycle. During the 2016 to 2018 was like uh, the vlogging era. Every creator known to man was doing the daily vlogging. But then I think a lot of creators and audiences started getting really, really tired with that. And so therefore creators then started experimenting with uh, long with videos that take a little bit longer to make. And this is when the spectacle era came through. So this was the era when like Mr. Beast was able to come in and say, hey, here's this big, ridiculous idea that took me a long time to make. Here you guys enjoy it. And people started really, really enjoying that. We had the three years of daily vlogging, and now we've had the past three years of the high, big spectacle, big idea content. And now we're beginning to have a, this really interesting change where the industry is so big now that we can have creators who focus on a big spectacle. And now we're beginning to have creators who want to bring back that really personal, very grounded reality. And we're seeing creators go back into uh, like daily vlogging or just well, vlogging in general that just share their lives. And so now we're sitting best of both worlds now. That's really interesting because in some ways, 
that makes sense to me because, you know, fashion has cycles. A lot of things have mm-hmm. cycles. You swing in one way, you kind of revert to the mean, then you swing back in the other direction. But this almost speaks to as if there are two content types that dominate mm-hmm. on YouTube. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if there's a third future or a different future that we might be moving towards, but you would know way better than I would. Do you think we're just going to oscillate between vlogging and, and spectacle for the next 10 years? I think what's happening is that now that creators are vlogging and, and bringing back the really personal grounded element, and that's bringing in lots of views, and then we're seeing the big spectacle content, and that's spectacle content, and that's bringing in lots of views. And then we're now having the creators that are simply asking, well, what happens if I put those two together? And I think one of the best examples was Ryan Trahan's Penny series. It was a big spectacle road trip adventure of him traveling across the US, but it was a beautiful personal story about him adapting to the environments and circumstances that he found himself in. So that's what I mean by a really interesting hybrid. I think Airac has definitely been experimenting with this as well, where they do bring in the big spectacle idea, but it's having a, an emotional impact on him and his team uh, as they experience it as well. Jimmy is also exploring it. Like he... He, uh, he tried the video where he was fasting for 30 days, try to make that a bit more personal. So, uh, But as a very creator, we saw trying to improve in how to tell those stories a little bit better. Creators are beginning to understand how much better of an emotional impact you will have with your audience if you're simply vulnerable and ready to have those grounded moments with them. You will develop a much better core audience because of that. Yeah, and that's actually kind of the experience I have with a lot of the creators that I talk to because I mostly swim in this world of people who are educators on some certain topic. And so they're never going to be as big as Logan or a Mr. Beast or an Emma Chamberlain, but they almost do like this vlog style stuff. That's pretty highly produced and ultimately like teaches people something. And some of Mm -hmm. their videos will get hundreds of thousands or even peak a million views, but it almost feels like they get kind of lost in the wash of discussion of YouTube. I think they're looking at you know, the Ryan Trahans and Mr. Beast, and they're saying, I don't even think this is the game that I'm playing, and I don't know how to win the game that I'm playing. And I'm curious if you've spent any time uh, looking at channels that are a little bit more niche like that. It's definitely been one of the curses of YouTube where we look to what are the biggest creators doing, and then we feel obligated to only be doing what they're doing. Because of this, they're going down the wrong path and missing the most important lessons to make their content specifically work. And so if you're doing some educational style, like the a genuine ask, why would you feel like you need to look at Ryan Trahan or Mr. Beast as the inspiration? That doesn't make sense to me. Just because what is popular, you don't have to be obligated to do that because once you then begin exploring what you can do as an individual, you're going to stumble upon something that makes you stand out. And then suddenly you're going to get the millions of views and everyone else is going to start trying to copy you. So I'm thinking just giving yourself permission to not copy or not, or to giving yourself permission to not be directly inspired by what's on top will make your content inherently better. I'd love to talk about this, this leap that you've made now to go completely out on your own. And now you're doing the editing podcast and you're really focused on putting yourself in front of the camera. Why was now the right time for you to do that? I wanted to be a YouTuber when I was 12. It's, it's one of those classic stories. But if I'm completely honest, it was, I was still developing my personality, I would say, or at least even maturity. And so I never really felt like it was the right time for me to be a creator because I was still trying to understand and bottom line, fall in love with myself. It's only really until recently, and especially the best way of putting it, my pandemic project was therapy. (laughs) And so I managed myself to find like the best therapist who's really able to help me find Uh, how I can feel most comfortable with myself. And then through that, it was me being the editor for Logan and then seeing the millions and millions of views. I was able to kind of, if I'm honest, project that success onto me a little bit as well. Slightly unhealthy. And so I was like, okay, we need to make make these changes. And so it was for me ripping the Band-Aid off and going, okay, what I feel like I'm in a mature place where I can express myself and be and be a be a decent personality and charismatic personality that people are really interested in. And I found that just by my pure passion and my pure love for YouTube editing, that I treat it as seriously as someone would Hollywood editing, people found that really infectious. I wanted to find the right time for me to st- finally start be- being a public creator myself. I'm interested in the strategy that you decided to take when going out on your own, because, Mm. you know, 
as we we're just talking about, like working with a Logan and doing videos that have mass, mass, mass appeal is probably not going to reach that size teaching people editing. Not that it's a small niche at all, but how do you reconcile that in your mind with your strategy and how you're going to go about doing this? Because it, it isn't also like you're doing vlogging. You're not doing vlogging. Mm-hmm. You're not doing spectacle stuff. So how have you decided to frame your content? If my video gets 100,000 views, that's like Mr. Beast getting 100 million in one of his videos. Like that's the audience that I know I want to capture. And when I can capture them on 100,000 views, I've done it. Like I, I've, I, I, that is my banger video. I very much knew from the get go, I'm not gonna get the millions of views. That's not the audience that I want. Those 100,000 or so that I do get on my videos, those are the people I want to listen in. Those are the people I want to help inform or educate or entertain. And if I'm giving them a great experience, I'm happy. That's exactly what I want for my audience. And so I very early on accepted that I'm not going to be millions and millions of views because actually that's not the audience that I want to capture. I've heard you say that you guys didn't look at analytics much when you were producing Mm -hmm. videos for Logan. Now that you're doing things on your own, are you looking at your own analytics and are you using that as any type of guide? One of the advantages that me and Logan had was we were both very natural storytellers. We, we knew the film language on how to tell story very efficiently and very effectively. And so that's why our videos always worked. And now creators who are trying to learn how to do storytelling look to analytics to try to teach them that, what was working and what wasn't. But we never really did that. I take analytics with a massive grain of salt, whereas a lot of people treat analytics as a fact. I treat it as a loose interpretation. And so I look at it and went, okay, I got a dip here. Uh, I, I guess maybe I spent a bit too long in that point or maybe I wasn't quite clear enough. Okay, I'll do better next time. Whereas a lot of creators will look at that data and say, we can never say this type of thing ever again, cut it out. My main feedback is how was I entertained making this video? Was I entertained watching this video? How did I feel? Was I ever confused or was I ever having a really entertaining experience through this? I look to myself emotionally and internally rather than allowing external data to tell me where I went wrong or went right. When you're preparing a video, Mm. what are your top priority items to get right and in what sequence, if that makes sense? I'm just interested, like when you have an idea, what is the pathway you take to make your best video? And as you're editing, making sure like, you know what, if nothing else, I got to make sure I get this part right. Is there anything like that? One of the hardest parts of editing is the moments where you realize you don't know what to do next. Every time I start working on a video, I want to ensure that what the content I provide is the reignition for an editor to get back into what they were working on. There always has an element of inspiration. There's always an element of, yeah, you might not know what to do, but if you just start thinking in this way, you might find that solution. I think that for me is one of my biggest rules when I do come into making a video. Well, tell me a little bit more about your process in terms of storytelling? Like, Mm -hmm. do you start with a title? Do you start with a beginning and end? How do you, how do you outline and ultimately deliver a finished product? My priority is feeling. How does this make you feel? I would say I'm looking for this footage and I can see, okay, this footage has the potential to generate this feeling. I need to find a way to get there. Once I've achieved that feeling, I then look at the next scene or sequence and think, okay, this is what this type of feeling, I need to transition from this feeling to this emotion. And so I think that's always gonna be my priority in terms of storytelling. Storytelling is just change. And so if you're able to provide emotional changes, you're doing a good job. But even before the footage, like you have Mm. to know what footage to capture. So mm-hmm. do, do you storyboard out and kind of like build a framework for what footage to capture? What is the starting point for a new video? Is it just an idea? Is it the beginnings of an idea and the ultimate video comes out of the footage? That's the kind of stuff I'm trying to dig into a little bit. If I'm honest, it's because I've been an editor my entire career, whereas I get dumped footage without, without prompts and I then have to figure it out that way. And so my entire work, I'm, I'm, my work discipline is the wrong way around, where I film anything <laughs> and everything and then figure it out in the edit. <laughs> so I oh, have to be better at figuring it out at the start. That's a discipline that I don't have, whereas I, 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 I am the fix it and post guy. <laughs> so that's not, a, that's not good. It's not particularly professional. And so I think for me, yeah, I need to still develop that, those skills to, for, to work at the beginning. Well, something that 
I was watching today. I actually had a call with Patty Galloway this morning and we were talking about video interview podcasts. And he said, actually, I did a, an interview with Hayden and Josh on the, on the editing podcast and I really liked the way they did their intro. So I watched the intro because we we're talking about how we can get uh, a little bit better retention at the beginning of these videos. And I was like, damn, these guys crushed this intro. Yeah. I underestimate how important the first 30, 60 seconds of this is because I'm kind of new to it. But, you know, you have your video talking about how the the Pokemon card video you did with Logan had just insane retention. And that starts in the first 30 seconds. Yeah. So how how much of that is muscle memory now where you have like this implicit feeling of how to get early retention versus mm -hmm. an area of explicit focus when you're doing your editing? Early retention, I define it as energy. We could just start the podcast with like me and Paddy and Jordan and we're just sitting at the table. Hey, how are you doing? Let's get started. But that's very low energy. So my logic, so me and Jordan designed the idea of if we do a really high production storytelling introduction, it creates this massive energy up here. And now because of that, we now have all of this space to start it slowly diminishing over time. And because it's a podcast, that energy will dip. But then every now and again, we might have a really good banging line or a really good sound bite that brings that tension back up, brings the energy back up, brings the energy back up. It's so much easier to start them here and then have them dip rather than have them start at the bottom and try to get those sound bites in so they start building up that energy. That's a much harder process. And so our logic is, is to bring up the energy up at the start. And so when it begins to dissipate, it's so much easier to hold their attention because of that. When you're thinking about starting high energy, what creates high energy? We watch YouTube very passively. I think we, we, go on, we, we have five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes. We go and we instinctively go on YouTube and we just choose a random video. Okay, let's have this be in the background. My definition of energy is, hey, fuck you for treating this as a passive video. Let me tell you why you need to stop everything and watch this now. But I do it very politely, I would say, actually. Uh, and so I don't grab their head and say, uh, and start begging them to watch it. Like, uh, I've got a hundred strangers. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly that. Like that, that's pa like, that's frustrating. That can be patronizing and that will make me not want to watch your video. But it's like, hey, I've really worked harder than this. I would love for you to please watch my video. And then, and like as a gesture, an invitation that makes them go, okay, actually, I think I will pay full attention towards this video. And so it's, I think that's the difference for me in terms of energy is simply the quality of the invitation. After a quick break, Hayden and I talk about how he edits video introductions to keep a viewer's attention. And later we talk about how you can find and hire an editor. So stick around, we'll be right back. If you like creative elements, you would love my weekly newsletter, Creator Science. I send it every Sunday and it breaks down everything I'm learning about how to be a professional creator. It expands on the things we talk about here on this show and it even goes behind the scenes of my own business and shows you what I'm doing, what I'm experimenting with in my own journey. If you're serious about this, I think it is a must read. More than 14,000 creators already subscribe. So if you are not already subscribed, go to creatorscience.com and subscribe for free and I'll talk to you on Sunday. Welcome back to my conversation with Hayden Hillier Smith. Not only do I love the editing podcast, but we've actually taken some inspiration from it for this show. You've never seen his face, but you've seen his content. Paddy Galloway is an editing consultant who captured over 2 billion views and he learned editing with data. What I love about this introduction is how well it works in both audio and video and how quickly it captures the listener's attention. One thing I definitely want to emphasize though is that the intro is a collaborative process. Whereas I think me and Jordan wrote the script and we actually have hired an editor who is able to do those really, really well. But it is also under our direction. We give feedback back and forth. And so he already has an amazing initiative that I think we've also helped inspire him to go forward in that direction. But yeah, we work with him a lot. The rule is, and then we all understand this, is that you should still be able to understand the story without visuals. And I think the intro is a really, really important gesture of that. I think also part of it is, since we also host these on Spotify as well, knowing that it is a much more listening audience, we still gotta make sure. And so sound design, again, is another big element of energy. We're always taught in film school that you can get away with bad visuals, you know, like something being really grainy or poorly exposed or like the ISO so high that the person's washed out. But you can't get away with bad sounds. Like 
if we were recording this podcast with our laptop microphones, this would suck. But, but we're both using studio microphones and it's making it sound so much more better and easier to listen to. We're following that same logic where you should not neglect sound. And so each cut should have a motivated sound effect. This point needs to have a motivated sound effect to go with it. And so you can still have a decent understanding of the story without having to watch the video. Can you define what you mean by motivated sound effect? There's a good reason as to why. It's there. There's a rule in improv comedy called yes and, where someone says a line and you have to go, yes, and then we'll also be doing this as well. And then that person goes, yes, and that's why we should do this. And then, and then I then go, yes, and therefore let's go do this. It's there is a response to each other. Motivation's kind of following that same logic. If you do this, that means this happens. Because this happens, that means this happens. And so there's a response to each other. So it's following the same logic of yes and, and a motivation is a response to everything, everything else that is happening. How do you choose what sound to pull in? Do you look at a mm -hmm. large library or do you at this point have like a smaller group of you know, energy related sounds that you pull in kind of frequently. I've accumulated a massive library uh, of sound effects. Our, our editor who does the intro, he's got his own massive accumulation of, uh, of a library of sound effects as well. You kind of know what kind of tone you're looking for. And then you got to go through your library and see what matches that tone. And tone's really difficult to describe. It's just like a, I want a uh sound rather than a <laughs> ooh sound. It's just, it can be as simple as that. And you're gonna go through your library to see if something happens to match that. So simply a bottom line is, yeah, knowing the feeling that you wanna get and then going through your library to see if something happens to match that. Have you watched the documentary on FX, uh, Welcome to Wrexham? I have not, no. Ryan Reynolds and Rob McElhenney, a couple of you know movie stars that bought uh, a football team in Wales. And it's like a real life Ted Lasso documentary. It's kind of wild. I love it. What started to bum me out is I started cluing into the sound design of the documentary because I could almost predict the result of the game they're covering by the type of music they were playing early on in the story of the cut. <laughs> I'm curious, as someone who spent a lot of time editing, does that improve your enjoyment of like watching other things or does it detract from your enjoyment of watching other people's work? I call it the triple F, which is fantastic fucking filmmaking. If I am watching something and I hear a music cue or hearing a cut, or, 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 or sorry, if I'm hearing a music cue or I see a cut, or there's some sort of visual change, and I'm getting that emotional response, I'm like, oh, you've got me. Uh, and so therefore I then embrace it and feel it. But I'm just like, this is also the nature of filmmaking. It's very manipulative. It's, 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 uh, it's very sociopathic, I guess. And I'm thinking when I notice that they're doing X thing in a film, I'm like, well done, you're doing a great job there. And I, that actually, actually makes me really happy when I realize I'm being manipulated, which is odd to say out loud, if I'm honest. <laughs> I get happy when I know I'm being manipulated. <laughs> uh, but you're in on the joke. That's a nice I'm thing. in on the joke. Yeah, exactly. I want to talk a little bit more about the intros you do for your show. Uh, and I want to talk about your show in general, because it's interesting to me that as you went out on your own, you decided that interviews are a path forward you want to do, because it seems to me that that's not necessarily the easiest way to succeed on YouTube. Curious why interviews were interesting to you. I find myself wanting to talk about editing and content with every person that I meet. So if there's someone who's never watched a YouTube video in their life, I will still find an excuse to talk about YouTube or filmmaking with them. And so these are the conversations I really, really enjoy making and having. But I always thought that people weren't particularly that interested in it until I started talking about editing on my channel and people were like, oh my God, finally someone's talking about it. And so people do seem to really enjoy those conversations that I enjoy having. And so I found an excuse to be able to do those uh, three to four times a week and then we like we batch shoot and so we're, we're like we're like eight episodes ahead now but I'm just finding any and every excuse to sit down with my friends and say hey let's talk about what we love and we happen to make content out of it and so that's kind of my aim here it's just like finding more excuses to talk about what I love with my friends do you have any constraints or bounds that you put on the interview products that you make in terms of how long they are or structurally or things you do to try to give it as best shot of succeeding. One of my big rules, and it's definitely been uh, an already 
uh, a big piece of friction that I really stand behind is we can't just have anyone on the podcast. Like we need to find a way to package them. Like, can we put their name in a title and thumbnail and people will be interested in that click? Let's just say there's an incredible editor who did a really fantastic behind the scenes for X movie, but because they weren't particularly involved in the movie, they were more so in the behind the scenes, that's difficult to package. And so we, I'm so sorry, I, despite how much I love you, I can't have you on the podcast. But with that though, let's just say we're having an, an editor from a Netflix TV show. Why would a YouTube editor wanna listen to this person? And so one of my big things that I wanna work with is, hey YouTube editor, here's why you need to listen to this person. And so we like to push the conversations of you come in and then you're gonna have to tell us why we should listen to you. And one of the ways that we're working with that structure is they can come in and they talk about one of their favorite scenes they've ever, edit, ever edited it. We feel their passion. We feel how like how like how proud they are of that scene. That's going to make me go, okay, I actually want to listen to what you have to say now. And then once we've got that in, we call it the character defining moment. Once we've got them in, we can now allow the conversation to go into a bit more creativity. And then I would say more so maybe it's that we sometimes have some practical questions. And then we go into creative philosophy as well. And so in terms of like, what is it about you that makes you be in love with editing and all storytelling? What is it about you that I think you, what advice can you give to the industry? And so the invitation to, for them to share their perspective uh, is one of, I think is one of the uh, ways that we like to push for our conversations to go in that direction. You've taken a high production stance on the intro as we've already mm -hmm. kind of talked about. There's a world where you don't do that at all and you just go straight into the interview. Obviously, you've chosen not to do that. So can you can you talk about that decision and, you know, why why do a high production interview or intro? And if you have any bounds around that process either? This is the editing podcast. And we need to tell new viewers that we know what we're doing. And you can't particularly do high production, really amazing editing on a podcast. It's relatively standard. So therefore, my perspective is that doesn't really particularly give us the right to say we know how to talk about editing. And so it's to tell the audiences, this is the editing podcast, here's some really high production editing, here's why we have, here's why we think we have the right to talk about editing. That's what I mean by an invitation. This is what I mean by a gesture of trust. Please, can you trust us that we can talk about editing? What has surprised you so far as you've been out on your own in terms of good results or even disappointing results, things that didn't go the way that you wanted? I imagine at this point you've, you've had some learnings. One of our most best performing videos was why professional editors won't work on YouTube, which is a negative title and the thumbnail has a, like, has, has a conflict in it. So of course that's gotten the most views. <laughs> and so it is because that's drama. And so that's become our best performing video. Whereas if I'm not even kidding, that was a, we need to record a video this afternoon because of our schedule. Screw it, I found us Reddit post off we go. It was like, just like we wanted to just get a video out and that's become our best performing video. And so, but again, it's because conflict and drama and also money is in the, and is in the thumbnail as well. That's why it's worked. Whereas then there's another video where me and Jordan talked about the things that we're most passionate about. And so we talked about some of the best edits we've ever seen, then the best edits we've seen this year, and some of the best edits that we've ever done. And for me, that's my favorite episode. I just the, the pure passion that me and Jordan talk about, it was incredible. And the people who watched it really, really enjoyed that. And they also said that it's their favorite episode, but it kind of underperformed. There's two things you can go with this. It's one, you can learn, okay, let's package all of our videos with conflicts and put money in the farm now. Great, off we go. Here's a, we get 100K views every single time. But that's the wrong lesson. I think the lesson that we had is we are still a low, a, we're still a low lift viewership channel. And so we still, we should focus on growth content for now. And then once you've established a bit more of an audience, we now have a better opportunity to express our personalities a, a little bit more and then people will start being more inclined to tune in for those. And so it was just, we made that video, the creative video that we talked about our best editing, that, that video was too soon. We should have waited a few more months once we've grown our video to then start investing into our audience. That was probably one of the best lessons I've had while growing this channel recently. This is low key, actually pretty high key, my least favorite thing about YouTube as well. Yeah. Now that we've been doing the show for like three months, like I understand the game and if we throw mm -hmm. numbers in the headline and we put money in the thumbnail or if we 
We create some conflict, as you're saying, like it performs better. You know, if, if I took that same approach to what I put on on a Twitter, if I'm just trying to like stir up conflict, I'm going to hate everybody that's commenting on my stuff. Like it's just going to draw negative money obsessed people towards me. And I have the assumption that the same is true on YouTube. And I don't know if that's actually true, but it certainly, certainly seems to perform better. And I kind of hate that. <laughs> It's 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 the open secret. It's the unfortunate truth. Uh, I think negative emotions are far stronger and much more powerful than positive emotions. There's a bit more of an inherent uh, instinct towards them because negative emotions gives place towards that self-preservation instinct. And so negative, we have to pay more attention towards it. Whereas ha- positive emotions mm. puts a, suggests comfort and where you can let your guard down a little bit more, so therefore you become less uh, aware of your surroundings because you're comfortable. So it's because of that fight or flight response is why drama and negative and money, money, self preserve a lot of people see money as self-preservation. I have to get money to ensure that I can pay rent that month. And so when someone says, I get paid X amount per month, they go, wait, I'm broke all the time. Could this be my answer to finding how I can get out of poverty or something like that? It's just money is inherently a negative emotion and has a negative connotation. So therefore we are attracted to it so much more and it sucks. Yeah. You mentioned that now you're going to lean into some growth oriented content for the next few months to grow the channel. Can you Mm -hmm. talk more about what that looks like and maybe what lessons we can pull from it as YouTubers ourselves? I'm still working this out myself. So I'm going to think probably a bit more, uh, I'm going to think through the mouth. Love it. I, I think what it is, is that uh, industry related questions, frequently asked questions, uh, maybe unfortunate truths. If I do want to go for the conflict thing hit like why professional editors won't work on YouTube, that's an unfortunate truth. I'll be it maybe hot takes, but with decent information to probably back up those ideas. Like that's going in a negative route, but whereas part of it also be like, uh, what is inspiring? And so it can be like, are you stuck on an edit? Here's how to fix it. And then where me and Jordan probably talk about how can you get out of a creative rut or things like that. What are ways that we can help inspire? What, what, what are ways that we can bring in new information that potentially is challenging a negative aspect of our industry, but then also positive frequently asked questions such as like, how do you get out of a creative slump? And so going with those philosophies, having those types of conversations, I think conversations is what's the best packaging for our content. That's where I feel like would be the growth. And so uh, challenging industry standards and how to be a better creator and editor yourself. Do you have any goals for yourself or for the team that you're aiming towards right now that you've like actually articulated? This industry has existed for well over 10 years now, but yet it's still very messy. There's no particular uh, best practices that is highly considered to be common. Everyone has a different idea of day rates. Everyone has a different idea of delivery. Everyone has a, everyone has a different idea of the, uh, the structure of workflow. And because of that, the web industry in terms of editing or post-production or storytelling is still the wild west. Whereas I look towards the film industry who have, that have existed for a hundred years and they've figured this out. And so they do have the regular hours. They do have the, okay, if it's the weekend, we get paid more. We, we do have the organizations that are able to help negotiate. There is still massive immaturity in terms of uh, editors and how we work with creators. And so I'm hoping that the podcast can help create a better baseline and a better foundation of a more healthier and better professional environment as well. When we come back, Hayden and I talk about how you can find and hire a great video editor right after this. Hey, thanks for watching Creative Elements. This is a brand new channel here on YouTube. So liking the videos, leaving comments, subscribing to the channel, sharing the show, all that support goes a long, long way right now. It is all seen, it is all appreciated. And even though this is a brand new channel here on YouTube, I've actually been conducting interviews with creators just like this for more than two years. There are more than 100 interviews that you can go back and listen to with creators like Seth Godin, James Clear, Cody Sanchez, Tori Dunlap, 
Even YouTubers like Ali Abdal, Matt Diavella, Roberto Blake, and Marie Poulin. I've actually created some playlists for you to help get you started, to dive into some of the best episodes that we've done to date. Just go to creativeelements.fm slash playlists. The link is also down below in the description, but you can filter episodes there by platform or medium. If you wanna just look at uh, episodes with YouTubers or just episodes with Instagrammers, you can do that with those starter playlists at creativeelements.fm slash playlists. And again, the link is down below in the description. Hey, welcome back. One of the biggest hurdles to breaking through on YouTube is great video editing. Of course, you can learn this yourself with hard work and years of practice, but I wondered if Hayden had any advice on finding and hiring a great video editor. Patience. If you're a really, really great editor on YouTube, you're already in a full-time job with it with that creator. So unless you give them an offer of triple their income, they're not going to budge because they're loyal. Uh, that's one of the things I do really like about this industry. There is a lot of loyalty, and I love that. But all of these editors have grown with that creator. If the creator keeps on growing, they need to bring that editor up with them. So that needs to be the, the healthiest philosophy. You look at my editing that I had with Logan when we first started in 2016, it's terrible. But me and Logan grew up together and then we became really, really great storytellers just by the experience of us working together for six to almost six or seven years. And so to hire a good editor is find someone who has a decent level of base talent and then be patient in teaching them your language teaching them your philosophy, teaching them how you like to approach story, teaching them how you like to approach content and giving them your patience and forgiveness for when they don't quite get it straight away. You do that for six months, you do it for a year, you do it for three years, you do it for five years. Suddenly you're able to trust them 100%, give them give them your footage and forget about it. And then suddenly it's uploaded and ready on your, ready on your channel for you to publish. That was literally pretty much what it was for me and Logan. It was just like, he gave me the footage, left me alone for a week or two, and I went, hey, it's up on YouTube, off you go. And, went, and, Lo and Logan went, fuck yeah, great, thank you, and then publish. We got there because of time. We got there because of patience. We got there because of forgiveness. We got there because we of respect as well. And so in order to hire a good editor is all of those elements. And so bottom line, you got to give them time. Do you recommend people go to like an Upwork or a Fiverr or is there a different way for people to find even like junior, just beginning started editors? I think if they were on Upwork, they're looking for probably more traditional work or more corporate work, slightly stereotyping, but that's how I feel about Upwork. What my editor that I hired that I really, really highly value and respect, uh, I found him through TikTok. He was posting really high production uh, videos. I thought, wow, this is a style that I love. And so I sent him a message to say, hey, I'd love to work with you. And so I give him, so, so we're working on a freelance basis because he still has his own aspirations that I highly respect and, 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 and encourage as well. If I'm honest, it's, there isn't really a definitive place. I mean, I know Paddy Gallery also just posted his YouTube jobs website as well. That's probably a great place to find work. A lot of work is also still found through word of mouth, or at least my work is found through word of mouth. There isn't really a definitive place. I think you just gonna be able to cast a wide net and then start just pulling, pulling along that net until you catch someone that says, hey, I actually would love to work with you for a long term. If I'm just getting started on YouTube or I'm thinking about getting started on YouTube, do you recommend that I learn some editing myself before trying to find an editor? Yes. If you want to be able to communicate with your editor, you got to understand it yourself. You can't just hire an editor and then say, hey, make this better because they're going to ask, okay, how? And then you say, I don't know. So you've got to be able to, you got to have your own experience in editing to be able to explain it. In the same sense, you've got to have your own experience being a director. You've got to have your own experience being a presenter. You've got to have your own experience being a gaffer if you want to be lighting your sets and studios. With that experience, you can then communicate with people who know it better than you. But you got to have that experience yourself so you can talk to them. What is like minimally viable to try to get any play from... YouTube at all? If I'm starting at zero subscribers, like what are the minimum things I need to be doing to give myself a chance to get in front of new viewers? That's a really, really tough question, but I absolutely love it. If you're really starting from scratch, it doesn't matter because the first videos that you're going to make for the first year, or even say the first videos you're going to make for the first, for the second year are going to suck because <laughs> you don't know what you're doing yet. Of course, your videos aren't going to get 
tens or hundreds or thousands of views because you don't know what you're doing. You keep trying to do that, keep making videos for yourself, maybe keep making videos for your family, keep making videos for your friends, and then you get those 10, 15, 20 views and great. Great, keep going. Make the next video, make the next video, make the next video because you learn something better every single time. And then suddenly two, three years down the line, suddenly you're gonna realize, oh shit, I have 20,000 subscribers, I have 50,000 subscribers, I have 100,000 subscribers. Oh, off I go. You won't know what you're doing until you make those mistakes. And so the best thing you can do is make the mistakes. I see you haven't uploaded any shorts to the editing podcast channel. Are you guys thinking about shorts as part of your strategy? Yes, we just haven't quite, because we're still a, a low lift uh, organization, we still don't have the manpower to be able to manage and communicate with our other editors on how to make into shorts. We, we, just, we just don't quite have that organizational skill just yet. But we, we are intending to have shorts on a separate channel. So therefore the podcasts are a lot more easier to find, uh, despite shorts having this own tab very soon. But then with those shorts being highly valuable growth strategies, they will then be directing them to come back, on, come onto the main channel. And those shorts can be posted on TikTok. Those shorts can be posted on Instagram Reels. Those shorts can be posted on shorts. And so, um, <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's part of the process. It's part of the plan. We just haven't quite got that manpower just yet. What about the community tab? This is something I've been thinking about at probably not enough level of depth. How have you approached the community tab or have you seen uh, creators approach the community tab in the past in an effective way? I think community tabs are extremely underrated. I, I think they're a really, really great way to have a direct communication with your audience. So I have 260,000 people subscribed to my channel on Helia Smith, but I only have about 50,000 on my Instagram. Why would I neglect sending a direct message to 250,000 people? That's why I think it's an underutilized tool. If you if you want a direct communication with your audience, they're on YouTube. And so keep talking to them there. One of the ways of doing this is if we're bringing in a large guest, let's just say we're bringing in Mr. Beast. I would ask in the community tab, hey, we're gonna interview Mr. Beast, what questions would you like to ask? I think we even did that with Paddy Galloway and we got amazing responses that helped inform us the conversation that audiences wanted us to have. It's also a very good way, let's just say, we happened to have not posted at an optimal time. We can probably the next day make a community post, hey, we posted our video yesterday, if you missed it, go check it out. And so we can do a second wave of viewership just because audiences happen to have missed it. If we have a collaboration, if we have an interview, so for example, I will share this interview on the community tab. Hey, I was on this interview, go check it out. Therefore, my the viewership of the editing podcast is going to come onto this episode. It's a really, really underutilized and undervalued platform to help communicate with your audience and start sending them in the direction that you would like for them to go. Who are some of the creators that you're watching for inspiration because you think they are at the cutting edge of a trend or doing things different in a really positive way? I, I'm mm -hmm. sure you would have an interesting take on this. It's no secret and very obvious that the biggest inspiration for the editing podcast is Colin and Samir. They gave industry permission that we can start talking about YouTube seriously. That was a huge moment for me. Finally, we can have these conversations that I've been wanting for years. I've taken on massive, massive inspiration. Also, also the good friends of mine as well. And so, like, so I'm very open-minded. Like, hey, uh, you, I, I really love your thumbnails where you had a conversation, a thumbnail that ha that raised a good conflict in question is it okay if I can borrow that concept? And they're like, yeah, that's okay. Due to just the nature of me working with Logan, Impulsive is another really, really great example where it is it is just just a bunch of boys hanging out and having a good laugh. And so that, that I, so me experiencing that firsthand, I still go with that direction. And so I would say Colin Samir and Impulsive are two really good mixes that I'm blend, trying to blend together into the editing podcast. Man, yeah, it seems... I look at stuff like Impulsive and these these more entertainment shows that are like in person podcasts that are just really chill, mm -hmm. and they don't. There's not a great like business world corollary to that. Mm -hmm. uh, that's actually something that uh, Connor, my editor, brought to me as like, hey, we should try to figure out a way to like get more of this vibe into the world that's a little bit more overtly business centric because it just doesn't seem to have crossed the chasm yet, unless mm. you've seen differently. I think you're right. I think people really like to see X industry through Y person's perspective. People like to tune in to Colin Samir because they want to get the accredited economy from their perspective. People tune in to Logan 
because they want to see what Logan's perspective is on X drama that happened that week. So if Steve Jobs had a podcast, how incredible would it be to hear his perspective on the Apple products being made? Like I think perspective podcasts, I think would be highly valuable. And so if there is someone in the business who was really top tier that is able to share their perspective on business, that would be a breakthrough moment for podcasts. That's something that I think you guys are already doing well on your channel that we want mm -hmm. to prioritize a little bit more is when you're an interview show, if you only do interviews, you're almost by default putting yourself in like a secondary position to mm -hmm. your guests constantly and not yeah. like able to give your own perspective enough. And we're realizing the opportunity to doing more just like me direct to camera stuff to start to build some some perspective for people or to build the ability for people to understand my perspective on things. Was that an intentional choice that you guys made or is it just kind of happened that way? Oh, absolutely intentional. It was even a massive discussion where it was like, we, 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 we were considering either how much of our personalities do we put into this? If it's just an interview with X person, X person, X person, and therefore none of it about the host, who am I actually tuning in for? It becomes a difficult emotional connection for you to then, well, emotionally connect to that show. It's just that we bring in a Netflix editor, people are gonna tune in knowing what's Hayden gonna to say to the Netflix editor. Like that brings in such an extra element of life towards the content that we make. And so that is why I don't want particularly have interviews. I could probably have a couple questions, but I want it to then be an invitation for a conversation. Hey, what do you think of this? This is my opinion about it. That's interesting because I think this. I love the fact that you think like that because I feel like it could be this way. Well, actually I disagree. How could, what if we try it this way? And then it becomes a debate or a conversation. That's more interesting for me. But then I wouldn't be able to do that if this was a pure, if my content was purely, ba was purely interview based. Well, we already talked a little bit about how we're seeing a little bit of a return to vlogging. With the last couple of minutes here, I'd love to hear if there are any other predictions you want to make on where things are going with YouTube, what types of content you think will start to pick up, and if we're going to have new copycats doing a new type of thing. I'm thinking a lot of creators have been obsessed with the idea of growth. Try to get 10 million, try to get 20 million, try to get 30 million, try to get 50 million views. I, a lot of people have started focusing on views and so they've, they do the high retention content because of that. But then when you try to make your content cater towards everybody, you end up catering to no one. And so therefore you might, I might have watched that whole through, that whole video, but it in the end probably meant nothing to me. Creators are starting to wise up to that and now beginning to invest a bit more onto I don't care if I get 70 to 80% retention. If I get 50 to 40% retention, but that 50% of people that stayed meant they had a much more better time, then I've made a good video. And that video might only end up getting two, three, four million views, or maybe even in my case, 100,000 views. But those people that stayed and had a great time is the people that I wanna make the content for. I think creators are gonna start changing towards investing in the audience they already have, rather than always trying to be as big growth as possible. I love it. Well, uh, the editing podcast, I'll send people there. Anything else you want to call out as something people should investigate after the show? Check out the editing podcast. Check out my channel as well, Hillier Smith. And I'm still trying to push on my socials. So if you can put, so you can follow me on my socials as well. Yeah, I think going back on my last note, uh, if you start investing in your audience now, you're going to be ahead of the curve. So invest in the people that you already have and make sure they have the best experiences and best relationship with you. And you're going to have a significantly stronger core audience because of that. This is a great primer on where YouTube is heading. If you want to learn more about Hayden, you can find him on YouTube at Hillier Smith or the editing podcast. Links to both of those, as well as Hayden's Twitter, are in the show notes. Thanks to Hayden for being on the show. Thank you to Connor Conaboy for editing this episode and Nathan Tonhunter for mixing our audio. Thank you to Brian Skeel for creating our music and Emily Klaus for creating our artwork. I'd love to hear what you think about this episode. If you enjoyed it, tweet at me at jklaus. Let me know. And if you really want to say thank you, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Thanks for listening, and I'll talk to you next week.